All right, now we're proceeding with lesson two, and we're, we're learning about flight through fly to learn. Last lesson, we learned by practicing taking off. You press P to pause, you turn off your brakes, then you push in the throttle, and you hit fly. In the next lesson, um, and we also learned, I should say before we go to the next lesson, uh, we talked about energy. And we talked about these three instruments, airspeed indicator, attitude indicator, and altimeter. Airspeed tells you how fast you're flying. Attitude indicator, if it's blue, you're going up. If it's brown, you're going down. Altimeter is how high you're off the sea level. Not how high you're off the ground. That's important if you're flying in mountain country where, yeah, the sea level's 3,000 feet, but uh, off the ground needs to be, you know, 2,500 feet. And you're... Um, or even worse, you're at sea level at 3,000 feet where you are on the ground, and but the mountains are 4,000 feet, and you'll fly right into the mountains. That can be a problem. Not much today, but it wasn't really the early pilots. Now, um, and then we looked at potential kinetic energy in terms of making our plane fly up and down. And what we found is if we point the nose down in the aircraft, the plane gains airspeed. And if we point the nose up, it gains altitude, loses airspeed. So what this is telling us is potential energy or airspeed on an airplane, we trade that for altitude, which is potential energy. So when we climb, we lose airspeed, but we gain altitude. When we dive, we lose altitude, but we gain airspeed. And this reinforces the notion that energy is not created nor destroyed. It simply changes forms. Okay? So, today, if you don't have your PDF out, you don't have x -plane out, you might want to put them on, we're going to go to lesson two, and we're going to talk about forces. And we're going to talk about the difference between mass and weight here. Mass is a combination, mass and gravity give us weight. Mass is, um, and one, one important property has what's called inertia. Uh, think of inertia as this property where of I call it laziness. An object in motion just stays in motion. An object at rest just stays in rest. All right. Uh, that's also Newton's first law, by the way. So mass is a measure of matter, and it describes uh, inertia associated with mass, where weight is associated with mass and gravity. Let me give you an important distinction. If you go out to space, you see a big satellite. Sometimes they're as big as a truck. They weigh tons, for example. On space, I should say on Earth they would weigh tons. Um, on space, um, as you get close to, excuse me, outside of Earth's gravity, it gets weight that's close to weightlessness. It's not masslessness, it's weightlessness. And what that says is, yeah, on a scale, it would be very low weight. But on, um, it would still have its mass, therefore have its inertia. So if you're an astronaut and you're sailing across, there's a spinning satellite, and you're thinking, well, it doesn't weigh anything. I can move and grab it. Um, if you would grab it, it would spin you because your mass hasn't changed either, and it's much less than the satellite's mass. So that's an important difference. Yes, does it weigh next to nothing out in space? Yeah, because there's really no gravity associated. There's no acceleration, no gravity associated with it. It's got what we call microgravity. Once we get into, um, but the mass has not changed, the inertia has not changed. So as we talk about the forces here, we're going to be talking about mass times acceleration. This is due to gravity. Gravity on Earth. It will change as we get to, uh, say, in the moon, which we'll talk about a little bit later. You're going to be looking at a flight where we look at the weight of the airplane and takeoff's distances. And we're going to take change that weight by changing the payload. So we will go to quick flight setup. We will set up our airplane. Then I'm going to show you how about test data, payloads. Then you're going to practice taking off, recording those measurements, and answering those questions. And then we'll come back to it. All right. So again, hopefully you've got X-Plane up. And you have uh, this PDF, so you can fill this out. All right, so here we are. We're in Fly to Learn and x -Plane. I'm going to go to Quick Flight Setup. I'm going to go to Runway 8. I've got my little Cessna plane. Boom, there I am. All right, now, what I'm going to do next here 
is, again, let's practice. So I use up and down arrow key. I can look on this. I click out here that square. I fly inside there. If I want to take off, I'm going to hit the brakes, go down arrow key, and push in the throttle, not the red button, the black button. Now, the problem with this is, okay, I'm driving here. Let's get my arrow down here so I can look at what I'm doing. Oh, no, I get that error message because my demo key on there is off. All right, I had it pause, so it's running over there. If that happens, I have no control. So just restart the program when that does. Let me go ahead and pause this and restart this back up. All right. Now, the problem with this, we can use our instruments to tell us what we're doing. But if I go to take off right now, I'm going to have instruments that are kind of old and dated and not going to give me very exact information. So if I go into settings and I go under um, data input output, I can select speeds, distance traveled, and landing gear vertical forces. And I can send it to the internet, serve it on a disk, but now it'll be in the cockpit. So watch over here. So there's the values right there up on the screen. Also, I can graph said values. So let's go ahead. I'm going to practice taking off and just again, pause, brakes, down here, pushing your throttle all the way. You don't want to get into an airplane and slake off partially. I'm going to unpause and start going down the runway. A lot of times you have to pull the plane, want to pull to the left as in real flight. It's getting up to 60 miles, 60 knots, I should say, 70. I'm going to go ahead and lift it up. There is a hot air balloon. All right, now pause. Okay, right there, that would give me a shot of the true airspeed, landing gear loads. We're going to come back to that minute. Um, distance traveled and feet. But that's just a snapshot. And how in the world do I know when I'm really taking off? That's where we go over here to, let's go back to settings, data input output, and we're going to do data C. Now, remember we had our data set, we were graphing it. Haha, -ha, so now we can see our graph. First, to make it easier, we're going to get rid of these four right here. V true, we're going to go all the way down until we get this V true and miles per hour ground speed for GS. Then we're going to get rid of all these except for distance in orange. Notice this color is different than that color. It makes the lines easier to read. And we have all the landing gear. Well, why do we do that? Well, let's move this through over time. And what happens is over time, we can see what the landing gear is doing. In this case, right there, the landing gear is at 71 pounds, 60, eight, you know, 687 pounds, 61 pounds. But once we get to this point, the landing gear is all zero. Well, why is the landing gear zero? Why does it have any weight at all to begin with, I'd ask you. Well, you have the weight of the airplane, the mass of the airplane times gravity here on Earth. It's pushing down. The landing gear has, to, and part of the Earth, has to push back up. Or the plane would just sink to the ground. That's a load on the landing gear. Once you're up in the air, it's not touching the ground anymore. There is no load on the landing gear at that point. It's hanging off the airplane. All right? Well, once it's all the wheels are off the ground, then we know that's what we're going to define as takeoff. Now, sometimes things take off. Look at the landing gear here. It bounced down. It was off of one wheel, then here. You know, not all three wheels are going to take off at the same time. Again, this software is very accurate. It's used in industry, so it reflects that. Now, if I go up here to that orange line, when the landing last landing gear zero, all the landing gear zero on that orange line, I can say, hey, that's the distance traveled. In this case, that's 1,106 feet. I can go up here and say, oh, there's the true airspeed, 78.22 miles per hour gallon ground speed. So this gives us a way to go from here all the way up to there. Okay? So that's what I really want you to get a sense of. This is going to allow us to graph things. Just take this line, follow where you have landing gear. Now go so far out, see it stopped, that's where I paused it. Over here is where it, very, it begins. A lot of times, like there it is, it's just sitting there. 
Okay, take it until your landing gear, which is red, yellow, and green. They're all zero. And get rid of these others would be another tip for you. Okay? So, that's going to give me information. Well, how am I going to use said information? So this, and if I hit A, by the way, I'm outside the airplane. If I use the arrows, so let's review. W puts me inside the airplane. A puts me outside. If I hit slash, I can get the landing gear. I can even see the lift forces on it. See? I'm going to hit slash again, slash again, slash, and it goes away. But A, W. Try to fly in W as much as possible because that, in reality, that's how you fly. All right? Okay, now. That in mind, go ahead and move this down a little bit. Okay. I'm going to go up here. There we go. So now, I'm going to do that, and I'm going to set the weight on my plane. So this was, what we did is we that's how you collect test data. So now we need to set the payload. Where do you go set the payload? Well, go to aircraft, select weight and fuel, and you can change it there. I'll show you that in a minute. Then you're going to take off. We're going to take. We're going to add more weight, which is going to increase the load. Then we're going to see what that does to our airspeed at takeoff. How much airspeed we have, and what's the takeoff distance traveled? All right. Does that make sense, everybody? All right, and then there's a payload you're going to graph what the average takeoff distance was versus the payload. We're going to keep doing that over and over, okay? Now, let me go ahead, go back into here. There we go. So if I go into aircraft, again, the menu pops up once I go up there. Let's go to aircraft. Let's go to weight and fuel. There we are. There's 300. There's 600. There's 900. Notice the red lights. You would never do this in real life. You never overweight, but we're, that's the great thing about simulator. Don't worry about it being exactly. Just get it close. You know, 602, 901 is fine because all we're doing what's relative. Change that. I would start off the leaving it to the default, you know, and then I would keep increasing it like that. The default payload, 299, or, you know, go to 299, 300, and go to 600. So go ahead, and you're going to repeat that three times. Okay? So you're going to th repeat that three times as evidence up here. Here's a payload of 298, payload of 600, payload of 900. Do it three times. The key is try to fly the airplane the same way. Try to keep it right on that cross as much as possible. Let me show you ex what I mean by that. All right, let me go back over here to uh, W. Look out the plane. There's a square. Try to keep your pointer as much as you can as you're flying it, say, right at this location the whole time. All right, we're going to learn that lift is involved in both airspeed and angle of attack. If you change this, you... Uh, you're basically going to change the angle of attack a little bit. We don't want to keep the angle of attack the same. That way we can see trends. All right. Now, after we do that, you get those numbers. I need you to graph it. Once you graph it, we'll go ahead and talk about these questions right here. All right. So I need you to graph that. Do the takeoff. Do a graph. It's going to take you a little bit. Once you've done that, uh, and go ahead and pause this, and then come back after you paused it. All right. Now, I'll go ahead, pause it, and do the flying, do the averages. Remember, the average is going to be the average is going to be three scores. These three, the three air speeds, the three takeoff distances, the average takeoff distances. These values total then divided by three. Graph those averages distances. Okay. Go ahead and do that. Pause this now and go ahead and work on this. Unpause it once you're done. Okay, hopefully by now you've graphed this. We can answer these questions. As payload increases, does takeoff distance increase or decrease? Well, I hope you found that it increases. 
Does a longer takeoff distance indicate more or less payload? Usually indicates more bigger payload. Does the airspeed go up or down as you increase payload? To get off the ground, you're going to increase it. Does a large airplanes require large airstrips? Yes, because chances are they weigh more. They are, and that's why you have big airliners can only land in certain areas. Uh, that's why the biggest, newest uh, aircraft, airplanes, excuse me, um, that, for example, Airbus makes. There's Boeing and Airbus are two big manufacturers right now. China's coming online with, with one, but right now it's Boeing and Airbus. Boeing's great big, uh, excuse me, Airbus's planes are so big, you, there's only a few runways in the world that can handle them. All right. Now, we talked about weight as a force. You have thrust, drag, lift, and weight. So these are the four forces that work on an airplane. Thrust, drag, lift, and weight. We're going to be learning about each of these over the next few days. But we just figured out what weight is. We're going to talk about next uh, how lift occurs, and we're going to talk after that about drag and then later thrust. All right. Now, this also explains that weight vector on the airplane also explains why the plane will pick up speed. When the airplane descends, part of the weight vector falls towards the nose. This speeds up the airplane. Part of the, when, when you pull your nose up, part of the weight well falls back by the tail. But the weight falling forward in that vector towards the nose is going to add more. All right. Now, the next point is a little bit, you can change. If you go under aircraft, make sure the payload's weight is 900. If you go on the special menu tab, set environmental properties, you can change the planet's mass to this number and uh, the mass of the moon, and you're going to get gravity now you know, one-sixth that of Earth's. Go ahead and take off on that. See what it does to your record takeoff distance, takeoff speed. How does it compare to the Earth? All right, go ahead and fly that. Once you're done, go pause, and then once you're done, come back to it. Come back here. We'll talk about it. Okay, finally, what happens is make sure you first of all set gravity back to Earth. Make sure that mu mass is back to 3.986, the mass of the Earth, and that should be gravity. Also, set the payload weight close to 298. Climbing higher, what we realize is we believe comets have bombarded on the moon. And if the comet hit hard enough, well, the comet is a dirty ice ball. So at the bottom of a big crater, if the comet hit hard enough, the ice might have just gone right and frozen. They didn't even get a chance to uh, melt. It hit so hard and it got cold so fast, it might have frozen right after it hit. That's the case. We're hoping to find water, and when there's some evidence to say we're going to frozen ice at the bottom of these big hole, if you can imagine, where the comet rammed into the moon. Well, if we covered the top of that and then heated up that ice, we'd have an atmosphere. If you did that, human beings, the weight would be so much less, our strength, you would be able to fly like a bird. All right? It's pretty cool. Um, So next lesson, it's going to be lift. We're going to talk about both Bernoulli's principle and Newton's third law, third law in describing lift. All right. Thank you very much.